Hello, and welcome to Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline. I am your host, Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck. I am a certified life coach. I help people personally, professionally, and financially. Our show is all about inspiration and hope. And our guest today is someone who's very inspiring. His name is Justin Rigliani, and he is the founder of Checkmates Charitable Association. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Dr. Jacqueline. I appreciate it. I'm so glad that you could come in and be here in person because it, during this pandemic, you know, it, it's nice to actually see someone and, and face to face talk. I know, I know. I, I'm a computer instructor. I do corporate instruction, and everything since March has been virtual. I haven't seen a person since. Just my immediate family, that's it. Wow. Well, thank yeah. you for, for doing this. It's wonderful. Thank you. Can you tell us about the charity and how you started? So I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2002, and I had various stages of health. Uh, sometimes my health was really bad, and I was in a hospital for mm. you know, 11 days at one point, and kidney stones and all the fun stuff that comes with ulcerative colitis and dehydration. And uh, I kind of just decided that in 2014 it was time for me to give back a little bit because I was feeling better. I was lifting weights again. I was playing hockey again. And I just thought, you know what, this disease really needs a face. Um, I think Crohn's and colitis are diseases that people just don't think about because they're bathroom diseases. Mm -hmm. They're not those sexy diseases that people talk about, like cancer and diabetes. And, Obviously, there is attention that needs to be done on those as well, but I think our community is neglected a little bit. So that's really the, the impetus of why I wanted to, to start the charity. Well, I really commend you for that. As you know, I'm a patient also with ulcerative colitis, and you touched on something that's so important that people don't want to talk about it. Yeah. And I know I lived in shame and humiliation for years and am now talking about it, and you're talking about it too. So tell us about this goal that you have for yourself. You mentioned lifting weights. I think this is really terrific. Yeah, so I, one of the biggest fears that I had, um, let me just take a step back real quick. In 2015, I had my 10th colonoscopy, and I was waiting for the results. And when they came back, I found out that I had high-grade dysplasia, which is really a precursor to colon cancer. And I, I just remember um, you know, hearing that phone call and the doctor saying to me, look, you know, that this means you're going to have to have the surgery and have your colon removed. And I remember dropping to my knees and just crying and, and thinking, you know, man, I, I'm 40 years old and I'm going to live with a bag. At the time, we didn't know it was going to be permanent, but I thought even temporary, I didn't want the bag. And one of the fears I had was that I would never be able to lift weights again. I had been a weightlifter since I was really 13 years old. And it was a big part of my life and, and part of my identity. And um, I went on the internet that week after I found out about the high-grade dysplasia, and I could not find anybody who was really a weightlifter. You know, I, I was searching and searching and searching, and I just felt my heart drop, and I thought, you know, this is really over. And um, I talked to my surgeon, and he told me about Rolf Benershka, who was a kicker in the NFL with a bag for seven years. And I said to myself, if Rolf could kick in the NFL for seven years with a bag, I'm going to be able to lift weights with a bag. So I talked to my surgeon about it, and he said, you know what, live your life. He said, I know hernias are a danger with an ileostomy, and he said, but live your life. And uh, right now I'm about 15, 20 pounds away from being the first ostomy to bench press 405 pounds. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you. So how long has it taken you to be able to get to 405? Um, I was, before surgery, I was close. Once I had the surgery and I went back to the gym after about eight, nine weeks, I was very weak. I mean, I was picking up 20 pound dumbbells and struggling with 20 pounds in each mm -hmm. hand. I mean, it was just so hard for me. And Gradually, I work my way up, work my way up, and, and uh, it's taking years. It really has. And you have ups and downs. Anybody who lifts weights knows that you have injuries where you have to take some time off. So it's not a steady incline. There's an incline, then you drop back a little bit. So, yeah, it's taken I, I'm five years with an ileostomy, so it's about five years. So that is really inspirational for anyone who's out there considering, you know, if they have to have a procedure, they might not be able to lift weights or work out or train. That's really a good story to share. I appreciate it, yeah. And you have this really good energy about you. I, our friends who are watching, they can't tell, but you're very positive and just feel this good karma coming from you. Oh, 
thank you. Yeah, same here. I mean, well, you're, you're you. an inspiration too. I know you've been through a lot, and you're but a fighter. We, thank you, but we keep going, right? It's the only choice. So you and I were introduced by someone from the Crohn's Colitis Foundation, right. and your charity is really interesting. We were going to work together on a special event that, because of the pandemic, was eliminated. Or that was really tough, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> it was Would like, you wait. share with, with our viewers about that event? Yeah. So uh, when Checkmate started, the first thing that we did was a, a hockey game against the Flyers alumni. And uh, we had some really great former flyers out there like Brian Prop, and we did it for uh, four straight years until the, the pandemic. And uh, this last one was gonna be the biggest one of them all. I mean, we had, um, it was gonna be Checkmates um, fielding two NHL alumni hockey teams. We had some players from around the NHL. John LeClaire was one, so that's a huge wow. thing, right? Today's yes. uh, uh, alumni, so. Uh, we we're going to have a big event afterwards at the Aloft Hotel, and we we're going to have so much fun. And still going to do it. It's just on, on hold, that's all. Now, considering what goes into putting an event together, there are a lot of steps and, and parts and pieces. Because of the pandemic, were you held responsible for any of the fees that you, know, you might have had to pay? I've been very, very lucky. The, the hotel reimbursed me the uh, deposit. Uh, luckily, we didn't buy food yet. So there was no uh, fee for that at the time. We didn't have a down payment or anything. So we really got away scot-free um, with the pandemic. I gave the players the opportunity to either be reimbursed for their donation to play or to just wait until we run it. And I'll tell you, these guys are great. They all said, keep the money. We know you'll run it, so we'll do it then. That's wonderful. They sound like a bunch of really good people. They are. They're really good guys. And, uh, they, they, they came to the plate when I needed them, so I appreciate that. And we have some pictures that we can show um, you with. Can we bring up the pictures, please? I guess we'll come back to the pictures. Sounds good. Um, so the name, Checkmates, how did you come up with that? Well, in hockey, when you hit somebody, it's a body check. Yes. And also in the game of chess, when you say checkmate, you won the game. So I wanted to blend those two together because I want to be there on the forefront when they say checkmate to inflammatory bowel disease. So that's where that came to me. I was with my family in Hershey Park. We were in line for the Comet uh, roller coaster, and that's when it hit me. I have no idea why, <laughs> but that's where I, I got the idea. Before you got on the roller coaster. Before I got on the roller coaster. Interesting. It's a great name. Thank you. I'm a big hockey fan myself. I used to follow the Flyers. and. It's ridiculous. I have to sit a certain way. This is when you listen to a radio, and I couldn't move during the game, and I had this necklace. It was just crazy, but there's, there's such a good organization. And you know what? The NHL players are a little different, I think, than a lot of the other sports because a lot of these guys didn't make the ridiculous money that, that players in other sports are making, and now even NHL players are making today, but they're very down to earth. Uh, I'm shooting a documentary right now about the Flyers from 1984 to 1988. It's called Keenan's Kids. Mike Keenan was the head coach mm -hmm. at the time. They were the youngest team in professional sports history. Went to the Stanley Cup Finals. Almost won a Stanley Cup. Um, and Mark Howe, Brian Propp, and Doug Crossman, three great players from that team, took the time, came to my house. Uh, we set up in my basement, and we shot for eight hours for the documentary. How many guys do that? Not very many. <laughs> and we had a meal. One of the scenes is us having a meal with those players, uh, with a lot of the kids that I, you know, my age, that are, I'm 45, so I was 10 to 13 years old, and my buddies were around the table with those guys at the same time. And it, 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 oh. the scene is just beautiful. It's really uh, incredible. So you were the producer of this? I am. Yeah. Have you done anything like this before? First time. But I align myself with a really good producer as well. My partner's name is John Paxton. He's done uh, several documentaries before, so uh, he's really been really a godsend. He's helped me a lot with this, and uh, I'm just glad to have him. What stage are you in now with the documentary? We have the trailer out right now. Uh, we just released it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, right now with the pandemic, we're really in a holding pattern. We have to shoot a lot more uh, mm -hmm. interviews, and it's just it's not feasible at the time. My hope is that as soon as we get done with the pandemic and we're back to somewhat of a normalcy, um, I'll be able to start crowdfunding and, and getting some corporate sponsorship. It's going to cost probably close to maybe half a million dollars to shoot. So 
you know, we're going to need corporate sponsors to get mm -hmm. involved with that. So it's going to take time. So a couple of questions. If someone wants to see the trailer, where can they find it? I have it on YouTube right now. It's uh, Keenan's Kids Documentary. Keenan's Kids Documentary. Keenan's Kids Documentary. Okay. And uh, right now I'm building the website. It's very barren at, the, at this point, but uh, I'm working on that myself. So we don't have a big crew. We don't have a big staff, so a lot of it is John and I doing a lot of the, the work. So uh, s slower than it would be if we had a larger staff. Okay. Yeah. And for those who don't know, what is crowdfunding? So crowdfunding is getting people who want to donate to the cause. Uh, part of the proceeds from the film are actually going to go to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and also the United Ostomy Associations of America. So um, we're trying to find a way that we can get people to donate to the uh, film, but also get a tax write-off of some sort for a donation to the charity as well. So we're trying to figure out legally how we could do that because, um, sure, we want to make some money ourselves and I have a family to support, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we want to make sure that this isn't just for the purposes of making money. We want it to be part of the cause. So uh, we don't know what portion yet is going to go to the charities, but there will be a portion. Well, congratulations on doing that. That's Thank just you. so generous, and you are just a kind, generous person. Thank you. I'd love to hear about your computer business that you were talking about. What, what do you offer? What services? So I've been training uh, in corporate training for 21 years. Uh, I started my own business in 2009, and I train people really around the world on the, uh, mostly the Microsoft applications, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And I do Microsoft Project and a lot of the newer ones like Teams. And I teach people either uh, virtually or I go to locations. Uh, I do one-on-one -on -one training with people. I train soft skills. I do things like communication skills, time management, project management. So it, um, it, it's a, a business that really is cyclical. So around January or even December into January, they're very, very slow. And then it really kind of picks up, and then it gets slow in the summer when people go on vacations. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's, it's what's helped me feed my family over the last 21 years. So That's a good thing. Yeah. So how yeah. do you allocate your time between your business and the charity? You seem very hands-on. To be honest with you, I work a lot, uh, pretty much day and night. Uh, a lot of it, I'm a night person, so I'll, I'll do some stuff even into the early morning hours. I build the websites for the, the uh, companies, both the charity and the, the company. Uh, also, b with Canaan's Kids, I have a production company as well, which is part of that. So yeah, I mean, it really is, it's, it's tough. You know, it's, it's not easy. Um, we don't have a really big budget, so it's very difficult for me to hire people to do these things. So I really got lucky that I had the computer skills so I could teach myself things along the road. So. That, was, that's, that's the only way it's worked. I was going to say, it sounds like you had a leg up because you already have a basic, basic to advanced background in computer skills. I can't tell you how big that's been. That's been absolutely massive. I do video editing. I would never have been able to do that without the computer skills that I had in the other applications. It just kind of translates a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm interested in some of those things. I'll talk to you offline yeah, about that. Sure, uh, sure. Believe it or not, we have to take a commercial break. For um, our sponsors are going to... Uh, tell us about their services, and then we'll be back with Justin on Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline. Stay tuned. I want to be a contender. I want a warm belly to sleep on. A big house. How do I look? Do, do I look good? I want to play hard. My nails done once a month. I want. I want. I want a home. I just want a home. I want someone to love. Last year, more than 30,000 companion animals came to us without homes. 20,000 of them were felines. Let's make some homes together. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Iorio. I'm the host of Rainmakers Roundup right here on RVN TV. The show is about looking for people who are in competitive businesses that are doing something different and unique in the world of sales and marketing. Join me right here on Rainmakers Roundup on Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. and then again on Thursday evenings at 6.30 p.m. right here on RVN TV. Today's show is sponsored by Dr. Jacqueline. Take charge of your life personally, 
financially and professionally. Visit drjacqueline.com to book an appointment today. Welcome back to Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline and my guest Justin Rigliani from Checkmates Charitable Association. We were talking before about all the things that you're involved with and we have some pictures that we're going to bring up and if you could walk us through what we're looking at. That's my, my wife, my beautiful wife and my two beautiful kids at uh, uh, FedEx Field in Washington. We went to a, uh, an Eagles game on the road this year so we, we took the pictures there as, uh, right before Christmas. Fun. You wonder when you'll be able to do that again, I right? know. I know. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> And there is uh, Amy and I at, at a wedding, a recent wedding for her uncle. Uh, so we got a chance to get out a little bit How by ourselves. How long have you guys been together? We've been together since uh, 2001 and married in 2004. Okay, very yeah. nice. Yeah. And there we are, Christmas in our uh, football attire. <laughs> We're wearing the Eagles jerseys. Amy's a Bears fan, so. Uh, she's got her bear stuff on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I loved how the pictures were all about your family. It's so special. And there we are with uh, our little one, Rebecca. Uh, Alex is to uh, her right, but Rebecca's holding up her uh, artwork. So we got to go to school and be a part of that. That's and beautiful. That's cool. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. What's your first memory of going to a Flyers game? First memory of going to a Flyers game was uh, with my dad and my brother going to a preseason game. We, we lived in South Philadelphia, right near the, the Spectrum at the time. And uh, I remember uh, the club that we belonged to, there was a boys club in the neighborhood and they got tickets and we went and it, I, I, I was hooked. I really loved it. It left a big yeah. impression. Ah, huge. It's interesting to me because when we're looking at those pictures, you know, who would have thought that going to a wedding or going to a game is something that now we don't know when it's going to happen again, you know, know, safely. It's just, it's amazing. So it's great to have pictures, to, and, but also a picture in your mind. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to move to your ulcerative colitis as, as a patient and your experience. And, you know, we share that we have that in common. And there's so many people who I speak to through the foundation that are literally living in fear and panic. Now they have to worry about getting the virus. When you think back to what you went through and the struggles that you had, and you have this goal for yourself now, I'm sure you've had goals all along in your life, but what is it that you can share with our viewers who are suffering with autoimmune illnesses, excuse me, to keep going? What inspirational message can you share? I think the, the key is just making sure that you know that you will get through it, that you're, you're not defined by that illness, that it's not over. Um, and I, I think the important thing that people need to know is that even strong people or who you perceive to be strong people have weak moments. I think people think that if I have a weak moment that makes me a weak person and that's not the case. I have down days. I have days where I'm like, why is this happening to me? Well, you know, why did, why did I wind up with a permanent ileostomy? And sometimes there are days where I just don't get going. But I know that tomorrow I can get going again. And I think that's the difference between people who stay stuck, thinking that one day of despair defines them forever. And it's not the truth. I like how you use the word define because you have an illness doesn't mean you are the illness. Right. Right. And because you are struggling doesn't mean that you are a failure. You can take all of those experiences and use them to grow. And I, I thought before I got sick and had the ileostomy that when I would see somebody who I thought was a strong person, I thought, well, they have all the answers. They're always strong. But I only saw them when they were strong. I never saw them when they were weak. So I thought if I had a weak day or a weak month and I was, I was depressed and out of it, that I would never be able to get myself out because I'm not as strong as that person that I saw on television. And that's just not true. That person on television has the same weaknesses that everybody else does. Absolutely. So when you're feeling weak, as we all do, I mean, last week was not a great week for me, you know, but it's another day, right? right? right. How does working out impact you? Well, I'm sure the endorphins start to build and, and that's one thing, but uh, I feel really good about being able to do the things that I can do at 45 years old. Um, 
so when I, when I bench press over 300 pounds or if I lift, you know, curl heavy weights, I, I just say to myself, look how strong you are physically. You can be this strong mentally. I do notice, though, if I don't work out for a while, if I just take some days off or if I don't feel well, mentally I'm not as strong. Mm. So it, there is a tie-in between the, the physical strength and the, the mental strength. Absolutely. So what's next for you? Well, right now it's... Uh, I, I had my book finished. I just wrote a book on um, my dealings with inflammatory bowel disease, the ileostomy, and I also have been a lifelong sufferer of depression, anxiety, and OCD. So that's that. The book talks about both of those things and how they kind of mix together. So let me understand this. Yeah. You're running your business. Yeah. You're running the charity. You're doing a documentary. You're lifting weights, and you wrote a book. The book's done. It's in. I just need a publisher now. That's oh nice. my gosh! Tell us about the book. Can you share the title? No title yet. Okay. We're, I'm working on that. Uh, but it's it's uh, hopefully going to bring light to two subjects that really don't get much of it. Mental illness is another taboo illness or, or malady that people just don't want to talk about. Um, it's embarrassing, right? I mean, to be anxious or, or depressed, you know, mental illness means you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I wanted to show is that it's not crazy. It's just an illness like anything else. And also, again, we talked about before that people don't want to talk about inflammatory bowel disease because it's, again, embarrassing. It's a disease about the bathroom. Right. You know? So in the book, I talk about my life with wearing diapers and having to go into line at a supermarket with adult diapers, you know, hoping they would think that I was buying it for my grandmother. Right. You know, right. Those types of things. I understand. And again, part of the proceeds will go to Crohn's Colitis Foundation and the United Ostomy Associations of America. So. so you're so generous. Well, they've done a lot for all of us in this community, so I think it's time for them to get uh, recognition. They really do a lot, especially the Philadelphia chapter. Oh. They're incredible. So with regard to the mental illness, was this diagnosed at the same time as the ulcerative colitis, or were they unrelated? Unrelated. Lifelong. I, I was in therapy uh, for my mental illness three, day, uh, three days a week when I was eight years old. So I was struggling with really crippling anxiety um, and OCD. And I take medications for it now, and I'm better, but I don't, I don't think it's ever going to be gone. I don't think it's something that goes away. It's chronic illness. Mm -hmm. But yeah, eight years old. I was in uh, therapy three days a week. Oh my gosh, that must have had such an impact on you because being just a young child and you're going to a therapist and your friends are not that you know of, right? right. So right. you had to keep that to yourself also? I did. I did. And Jacqueline, I think that part of the reason why I'm doing so much right now is based on the fact that I feel like I lost a lot of my life to those things, to depression, to anxiety, to inflammatory bowel disease. And I feel like I have, I really have to make up for a lot of lost time. So whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, a psychologist or a psychiatrist could say whether it's good or bad, but it, for whatever the reason, that's what's pushing me, I think, to do what I'm doing now. So I'm just gonna go with it, I'm gonna ride the wave. Well, thank you for sharing something so personal. And no judgment. I feel like I'm in the exact same position because I have suffered for so long with three autoimmune illnesses and I'm doing a million things too, right? And it, but it makes you feel empowered and it's kind of like, wow, I look back and I did use, lose years. Right. So now we have this time, let's make it happen. Exactly. So it's really incredible all that you've been through and all you've accomplished. How has your circle of friends change or stay the same throughout all of this? Um, I think the, the people who love you and have always loved you will always love you. I think they're going to stay with you through everything. Uh, my mother and father and my sister and my aunt all went up, and my wife went, went up for the surgery, and my parents stayed the whole time in a hotel. We went up to Inglewood, New Jersey to have the surgery at uh, Inglewood Hospital. Uh, so my family was there every step of the way. And with Facebook, it's incredible how many people can get to you and send videos and talk about, you know, you're going to be fine. And the emails that I got from, from friends from even grade school that I hadn't seen in years saying, I know you got this, you know, you're going to take it. And uh, that, that makes a big difference. That does make a big difference. Are you a big social media person now? I am. Yeah. And I already know because we're Facebook friends. But, so what are you finding during the pandemic? And we're in a, an election year. And 
rioting and protests and so much going on. It seems like Facebook is shifting, at least what I'm finding, that there's a clear partition between yeah. how people are engaging with each other. I'm, because of what I believe, I'm finding it difficult to, I don't want to say tolerate, but I guess accept when people don't think things are wrong when they're clearly wrong. I think that, that's what I struggle with the most. So if I have a friend who, opinions are a different story, but I think there is clear right and wrong with things. We know racism is wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, you know, gray area. Right. And I know that I have friends, unfortunately, who have thoughts that maybe racism isn't as bad as it's made out to be. My difficulty is I, I still love them, but I struggle with being able to accept that they think that way. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a wrestling match in my own head sometimes. You know, I don't want to cut them off and say, I can't be friends with you anymore because I do love them. Right. But it's, 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 you feel almost hypocritical sometimes being able to overlook that. So I think with social media, that's what's happened to me uh, recently. Yeah, I would say the same thing. And you and I were talking before in the lobby, we both had our masks on, right. about how there's a clear line of people who are not going to wear masks. Right. And it's, it's just a very interesting time. But I really admire all that you've been through at, and how you've shown up. You've shown up so big, and your focus is on giving back. Every project you're doing, you mentioned the Crohn's Colitis Foundation. So if people want to get in touch with you, Justin, how can they reach you? So I have... Uh, uh, Facebook page. It's uh, Checkmates Charitable Association. If you're on Facebook, you can find us there. We have a Twitter account. Uh, we have a Checkmates um, uh, YouTube channel. I have another YouTube, YouTube channel called uh, World Strongest Ostomate uh, for my weightlifting stuff. That's great. Yeah, and my company, my training company is just for you, training and consulting. Um, and we're growing. We're doing website development and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, you can find me. If you look me up, you'll see me there. And the same thing if people want to make a donation? Yes, we have uh, an ongoing uh, GoFundMe account. And there's a link on our website, which is checkmatescharity.com. And you can make a donation there if you'd like. We'd really appreciate that. Yes, please make a donation. Such a great cause. Our hats are off to the Crohn's Colitis Foundation in Philadelphia. The employees are stellar. Incredible. They're outstanding. It's such a well-run organization from the top down, and there's so many cool virtual things going on. I just did a 10 mile walk for the virtual walk that we have in June. That's so thanks to those who donated. And our time unfortunately is, is coming to a close on Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline. So I really appreciate you being here and sharing your story. It's so empowering. And I'm hoping that our viewers out there who are feeling somewhat overwhelmed or lost or confused that you, you have someone here who's been through a lot and is smiling and has this incredible energy and is giving back. So hang in there, stay strong. And Justin, thank you again for being on Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline. Thank you, Jacqueline. Your contact information it. one more time? Yep, so uh, go to uh, Check Me Charitable Association on Facebook. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, the, uh, you can just look me up, Justin Mergliani on Facebook. And Jacqueline, just want to add one quick thing. Sure. Um, as you said, if anybody has any struggles and they really need to talk to somebody, please reach out. I'd be happy to get back to you. So uh, I, I'd like to do that for people. So. That's wonderful. Thank you. And if you want to find me, you can go to my website, drjacqueline.com. Thank you so much for being here on RVN TV. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Stay safe.